Hello and welcome. You're watching our special show, Coronavirus Facts versus Myths. I'm Gargi Rao. This is the show where we get you all the latest on the pandemic. Now hit by the second wave, India has become the third country after Brazil and the United States to record over 3 lakh deaths linked to COVID uh, since the pandemic broke. Over 90,000 deaths, nearly 80 lakh cases have been reported just this month so far. India's total uh, tally has crossed uh, 2 crore, 67 lakh, 52,447. And uh, in fact, uh, According to the Union Health Ministry, the death count increased to 3,3720 3, with 4,454 new deaths being counted in the last 24 hours. Now, the big focus on the show is India's data challenges. This is something that many experts and scientists have pointed out that due to the lack of transparency and the correct data that is available, it gets very difficult to make the correct analysis. To talk more about this, we're joined by Professor Brahmar Mukherjee, health data scientist, chair of biostatistics at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And she's also someone who had pointed out in February that India's numbers were going up and that it was a matter of concern. Now, Professor Mukherjee, what would you say about the data in India so far? We know you've been studying it for, you know, since the pandemic began here. And many of you experts have concerns about India's data and the transparency. Yes. So, so first of all, I do think that in spite of the data challenges, uh, I do feel that the peak in terms of the peak period for national infections uh, has gone uh, it's on the decline. We have to be very cautious because the national peak is a nebulous concept. There are many state peaks layered under the national peak. So we have to keep in mind that um, not all states have crossed their peak. Infections are still rising in some states and some states are in a tantalizingly poised situation where you need to control and continue with your state of containment. But uh, I, I would like to say that even with imperfect data, we are able to pick out the relative trends and signals, right, to identify signals from noise. For example, when we first saw the uptick in February, we could actually say that there is um, an uptick. And um, for the peak to be in beginning to middle of May, many models was, uh, were accurately predicting that. So I think that the main concern is in terms of what the actual numbers are, right? So the data sparsity in India is hurting us in various different ways. And I'll just give you two examples. So it's incredibly hard to find age and sex stratified infection, hospitality, and mortality data for COVID in India. And there has been a lot of hypothesis and anecdotal reports that younger people are dying this time in wave two. But we could actually really compare this. There should not be any ambiguity about that. We could have the data for wave one and wave two. And it's not just about the numbers, right? Uh, because this influences policy. If we really find out that a lot of people in 40s and 50s have passed away, leading to a loss of major income for their families and children, so we need to set up the policies to support those families. So this is the data gap is not just for having modelers having accurate data because data is at the heart of picking up clues with this pandemic and also to determine future policies. Right, Professor. So if you could elaborate a little more on that about why it's so important to have this correct data. And, you know, because we've also seen from certain states like, you know, Uttar Pradesh and Gujarat, we wouldn't have been aware of the number of deaths taking place had it not been for the local reporting, uh, you know, the visuals that were shared in the media. We all saw those terrible pictures of bodies in the Ganga. So uh, clearly, uh, you know, we need more transparency and need better uh, data from these places. And tell us why it's so important. Yes, yeah, so it's extremely important. For example, uh, you know, you cannot estimate the peak or the timing of the outbreak, what is really going on without uh, tracking the pulse of the pandemic at a granular level with data. There, in terms of prediction of future waves, you have to be data alert so that you can pick up those clues and you're tracking the data. So there is, of course, a uh, philosophical and moral obligation to honor the life of a person through reporting of their death. But even without that, if you think about, if we do not know the mortality data, if we do not know what is the state of infection, 
how can we estimate that this is where the disease is going next and we need to be high alert, scale up our oxygen production, prepare for isolation centers, because without good data, you are not able to forecast accurately, and that really affects your planning of healthcare resource and utilization, and also future planning in terms of policy. One another way of getting at the data will be to have accurate mortality data, even with, without COVID, right? Just the all-cause mortality data all over India so that we can see is the pattern really different in the last two years from what we have seen historically? I think people deserve to know in order to move forward with policy and with a proper assessment of the pandemic in a more holistic way. So if we talk about the numbers right now, uh, India has uh, crossed over 3 lakh deaths in total since the pandemic began. Uh, our daily cases are down uh, under 3 lakhs a day. By how much do you think our numbers could be off? So uh, in our calculations based on wave one, we always have estimated this underreporting factor for infections from 10 to 20 for India and the underreporting factor for deaths going between two to five. And there's a lot of geographical heterogeneity in these numbers. I have not done a careful wave two calculation because, uh, you know, reports are still coming in. Because there, the systems were really uh, backlogged, there are delayed reports of deaths which are being registered and coming in. So I want to take the whole period of wave two in a com comprehensive way, just like we did for wave one. But based on preliminary calculations that we have done, it seems like the, and as you might uh, guess, that the underreporting is much more acute in wave two because possibly because also the system was really collapsing with the pressure of the reporting and people were managing on the ground crisis rather than reporting of deaths. So I would say that it will be towards more towards the higher end of those intervals 10 to 20 and 2 to 5 for wave 2. So um, I would say that if you are reporting about 27 million cases in aggregate, it could be much more, and it could be 270, 300 million infections. And the death numbers, um, by all calculation, it seems like it's between a million and 1.5 million for, uh, like, you know, in based on our calculations. Again, if the, there were more accurate data, we'll know with the models are making incorrect assumption. We need to calibrate and check that. All right, deaths could be over a million, you see, according to your estimates. Now, a panel of scientists, you know, appointed by the center has said that the second wave uh, might, uh, you know, we might see uh, the end of it in a sense. We might see the numbers going down significantly by July when we'll see around 15,000, 20,000 cases a day. But they've also said if we don't take adequate measures, we could see a third wave in six to eight months. So, you know, I... Um Many people have many models, and so I think there is a general consensus among many models that the peak would be somewhere in between, like, you know, early, early to mid-May, and it will take a while for the curve to come down. We are still registering. I don't want people to forget we are still registering about 4,000 deaths and two more than 200,000 cases. That's really high numbers. Just because the peak has passed, there is no false sense of security that's that this this notion of we have crossed the peak uh transmit so i want to clarify that and the second thing is that we do see that by the if things go as predicted the number of cases do taper off and come down to the level that we were in january and february about 10 to 15000 cases at by the end of july but that's a big if because it depends on the assumption that we do not have another new variant with other different kinds of property brewing uh, underneath which is going on that we do not know because the sequencing data from India has also been very limited. Also how Delhi and Maharashtra and Karnataka come out of the lockdowns, right? So are we going to continue with lockdowns till July? That's also a big if. And so I feel that when we talk about third wave or fourth wave, General strategy as a public health professional should be we stay prepared for the nth wave till a large fraction of the country is vaccinated. As we come out of the lockdown, we have to take very nuanced strategic 
and optimized measures because we know a lot about how this virus spreads. Wear our masks, avoid large gatherings, and particularly indoor gatherings where you have to take your masks off, for example, indoor dining. So we, can, we have to make sacrifices in order to get through this period when our country is getting vaccinated. Now, Professor, the worry also is that with these new variants is that they're spreading faster. Uh, that's what uh, many experts have agreed. Uh, and, you know, we, we can expect further mutations. So do your models take into account the new variants? Yes, so, so that's, that's actually a great question. So right now we are building those multi-strain models. We are actually in the process of submitting a paper on that, that how you can, because the, when you, the national model, right, you, you have to really build regional models because B1617 is more prevalent. There's a geographic distribution of the different variants, the original strain, B1617, B1618. Um, and so we need to have more spatially distributed data in order to build multi-strain models. And it would be really wonderful to have more data on sequencing from India as well as how this variant and vaccine uh, interface is working, right? If we are having breakthrough infections, really prioritize that sample for sequencing so that we know the efficacy and the effectiveness of the vaccines against these new variants. The data that has come out of UK gives us a lot of hope that we still have effective vaccines. And so that's why, but you know, there are other variants that we are hearing about. We need more data on reinfection and breakthrough infection had a high priority for sequencing. So we have to be very strategic uh, in terms of garnering and extracting our information. But I'm very hopeful that vaccination, even in spite of the threat of all of these variants, is going to be our way out. All right, thank you so much, uh, Professor Pramar Mukherjee, for speaking to us here at NDTV. In fact, let's talk more about uh, the data coming out of England. Before that, do remember you can call in with any questions that you have later on in the show. Our doctors will answer any questions you have about the vaccines and about uh, coronavirus. Well, now let's focus on a study by Public Health England that shows for the first time that two doses of COVID vaccines are highly effective against the B1617.2 variant, which was first identified in India. Vaccine effectiveness against symptomatic disease from B1617.2 variant is similar after two doses compared to the B117 variant that that's the dominant variant in the UK it was first identified in the UK but there is a slight drop uh, in that efficacy but what's also interesting is there are that reports seem to suggest that the variant uh, first found in India does not seem to cause more severe disease even though it may be more infectious for more on this we're joined by Dr. Rajiv Jayadevan senior consultant a gastroenterologist and deputy medical director Sunrise Group of Hospitals Kochi thank you so much doctor uh, for joining us. Uh, tell us more about, you know, your takeaways from this study that has been released in, in England, uh, especially let's first talk about the vaccines and it's found uh, that the vaccines are effective against the Indian variant, uh, the variant first found in India. Uh, there's a slight drop, however, when you compare with how effective they are against the variant found in the UK. Yes, firstly, for our viewers, I think they need to understand that variants are not horrible creatures. They are just normal expected evolutionary outcomes of a virus. So what we see in India, to start with, to answer your question, uh, as of now, when I look around here in this area, is that people who are vaccinated are not getting hospitalized. They're not coming to hospital. Our hospitals are full, but there's no one in the hospital who has received two doses of vaccine. That is hard evidence, on the ground evidence that vaccines work. Now let's shift to England. We are, we've been discussing the so-called Indian variant. You know, it's rude to attach a country's name to a, to a, to a virus, but uh, for want of a better word, we can call, call it so-called Indian variant, whose number is B. A variant one, found in so India, that's what the government also prefers us to refer yeah. to it. Yes, go yeah, ahead. But, yeah, but it's, you know, without prejudice, I think we should stick with the international uh, etiquette that we should really not call an Indian variant. It's rude. And uh, same thing with Brazil variant. We don't say that. It's Absolutely. P1 and so on. So let's stick with B six one B dot one dot six one seven two, which is the offshoot of the original Indian variant. Now uh, we have some very good data uh, coming in from Public Health England, who've done a fantastic job in keeping the rest of the world up to date with what is happening in England. Their genomic sequencing is is very good. Their genomic sequencing rate is among the best in the world. 
and they have actively sequenced all the cases that are coming into their country. So therefore, as part of that evaluation, we have almost 3,000 patients that they have identified with this new variant, 6172. And uh, what is encouraging is that only about 1% of these people require hospitalization. So uh, that is the same as the original old model virus. So that is profoundly encouraging. I know 3,000 is not a small number. It is not a very big number either. Uh, right. The other aspect is, well, as like yourself and uh, Professor Mukherjee said, the vaccines. Uh, uh, those who have received two doses of vaccines, uh, you know, in England, they use AstraZeneca vaccine, which is the British version of our Covishield, and they use a Pfizer vaccine. So if you take both vaccines together, those who have received two doses are more than 80% protected from symptomatic disease. Now, we know, uh, most people know that in vaccination, we talk about two different categories of protection. First is what is said in the literature, that is your symptomatic disease protection. But what doctors and as public health experts, what we are more bothered about is what is called serious or hospitalization or critical illness protection. When it comes to critical illness protection or severe disease protection, all of the 10 or 12 vaccines that are licensed for use around the world, they're all excellent at, at preventing severe disease. Of right. course, there will be exceptions. But, right, that's yeah. something we need to emphasize. What I also found interesting is that many of you drawn the, the you know, uh, it seems like this study also suggests that while we still don't know how much more infectious uh, the variant found in India, you know, is compared to the variant found in the UK, while it does seem more infectious, I think they're still saying either 50% more, 40% more, still not very clear on that. But the fact uh, that they're also saying that it perhaps does not cause more severe disease, you spoke about that, but just to emphasize this, because this is something in India we've talked about a lot, whether, you know, in the second wave, we've seen a lot of younger people affected, whether it's causing more severe disease. Uh, so far, according to this study, it seems that perhaps it doesn't? It does not. The, 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 for our viewers, there are, there are a couple of different entities here. The first entity is how many people are getting infected. And second is how many people are dying if 100 people are infected. Both are separate, um, separate numbers. So uh, the first number is how many people get infected. Let's say we unleash this new variant into a village. How many people will get infected? Now, it is estimated uh, all over the world through various modeling studies that it's, it is significantly more transmissible than what is existing, including the so-called UK variant of B117. So it's significantly more transmissible than what we had in our country last year. There is no doubt about that. But what is difficult is to separate the behavior of the virus from the behavior of human beings. It is incredibly, right. incredibly difficult to separate the two because you know, as was discussed in this panel, that the uh, the casual attitude of a lot of people who believe that the virus had gone away, so they had really been not taking many precautions, particularly Absolutely. in this part of the world. So that's that's the first part. The second, uh, more important question uh, from an epidemiological standpoint is how many people are dying? Let's say for experimental sake, you infect 100 people with this virus, with the new virus, and you infect 100 people with the old virus the same number of deaths will occur, the same number of severe disease will occur, the same number of people will enter ICU. And that is the most important part important message that everyone right. needs to So it, it's absolute numbers really that we're seeing in, in the second wave that makes us feel that perhaps it's, it's a lot more, uh, you know, causing a lot worse illness. Well, I'm completely out of time. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Raji, for joining us uh, on the show today. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, time for us to slip into a short break. On the other side, we'll get you the viewer question, the segment, and doctors will answer your questions. So do call in with any doubts you may have. Welcome back. It's time now for your viewer question segment. And we're joined by Dr. Amit Bhushan Sharma, Unit Head and Associate Director, Cardiology, Paris Hospitals. Thank you so much, doctor, for taking time out. Uh, we have our first caller, Abhinav from Kota. Go ahead with your question, Abhinav. Uh, yeah, hi, sir. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask Hello. that my mother is having an allergy from bee stings, actually. So, first time we went for the vaccination, doctor said that, okay, allergy, you have allergy, so you cannot get vaccinated. So, I just wanted a confirmation if we can get her vaccinated or not. Right, doctor? See, the allergy is mild and she does not have any symptoms of fever or shortness of breath and the saturation is well maintained. She can very well go ahead with the vaccination. So, uh, she can go ahead with the vaccination. Right. Why is this that they're being refused? Because this is the second question we've had on the show in which someone asks about, you know, an allergy. Another person had an egg allergy and they too have been refused at the center. So is it, uh, you know, are they just asking this blanket question? Are you allergic and then just refusing them? No, no. What happens is because it being a virus mRNA vaccine, uh, 
sometimes the chances of anaphylaxis or a severe reaction is there in which the patient becomes severely short of breath and may require even immediate ventilation also so that is the reason why if it's a mild allergy we will uh, avoid it i would prefer that uh, uh, if it's a something a serious serious allergy or the saturation is down then you might as well postpone the vaccination for some time but if it's a mild allergy you can go ahead all right we have another uh, caller nafisa from madurai go ahead with your question good afternoon doctor is yes. there a uh, definite curative treatment protocol for covid-19 because what had been medical facts you know like remedies were plasma therapy and hydroxychloroquine have been dropped now and they have become medical myths and my second question is is the dead body of the covid-19 patient <coughs> infectious and why can't we uh, hand over the dead body for a decent burial to the relatives after all the protective measures stuff right uh, dr bhushan i think a lot of people are you know very confused with 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 the medication that you know first we told go for remdesivir then not so she wants to know do we have any definitive treatments so right now ma'am see as it is uh, corona virus the studies are still evolving and um, it's an ever it's an ever evolving uh, science as we say so the medical treatment is based upon some randomized trials where in whether that it is beneficial or not beneficial so some smaller studies had shown that this to be the effectiveness efficacy before but over a period of time the longer trials have not shown but some i would still not totally take it off that it is not totally um, uh, it is not totally useful because over a period of time it does decrease the virus load though it has been taken off the guidelines in majority of the cases but if the virus load is uh, high nothing is working right it what we do know that something works something is useful what we do know that Absolutely. works is steroids but only at a particular time and you know when the the patient is feeling uh, some sort of shortage of oxygen and if the virus load is high it is uh, shown to decrease the virus load also in majority of the cases and and the second part of her question which is very poignant and i think a lot of families have faced this uh, issue about uh, you know uh, getting the body of their loved ones uh, after the death and you know they don't get to really see it or have that sort of uh, funeral that they would like to have um again um, see as i i'll go back on this question first is if the first 5 days or 7 days when we are uh, using the mask you are basically protecting the others because that is the phase of virus replication when the patient is alive after 7 days am i audible am i uh, yes yes go ahead me? yes go ahead yeah so after 7 days what happens is 7 days to 14 days 15 days is the period where uh, the maximum incidences of complications takes place and if the patient is protecting himself against this now so first 7 days you're protecting others say second 7 days you're protecting yourself as far as the dead bodies are concerned what happens is once you have a mass uh, funeral or a mass burial what happens is then it is again a source of contamination because we do not know per se whether 14 days have elapsed or not whether the virus is shedding is still going on or not so it is very difficult to streamline when was the peak phase reached so hence this uh, uh, hence this uh, the mass burial or mass funeral is not allowed right now that is the reason why all right well thank you so much uh, dr bhushan for joining us here on ndtv okay well that's all the time we have on the show today thanks for watching goodbye